Good afternoon and very warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. I'm Ian Golden and it's a huge pleasure uh, today as the director of the school to introduce Bert Hoffman, uh, who is the World Bank country director for China, Korea and Mongolia, uh, which you will, I'm sure, realize are, is the most important country directorship uh, at the World Bank because China is the most significant client, if not in the amount of money it gets, uh, in its importance uh, in the future of the world economy. So uh, Bert is not only uh, someone who is a very effective country director, he was previously chief economist for the East Asia region uh, of the World Bank, so understands the region very broadly and its economic evolution, and before that has played many other roles at the World Bank. I've actually known Bert for a frighteningly long time uh, because it reflects my age, not his. He was a, a young, a very young man. Uh, I was slightly less young uh, when we first met in 1988, uh, before some of you were born. Um, and uh, we've remained friends ever, ever since. Uh, that was at the OECD uh, Development Center um, where but uh, almost began his career because he was at ING before that. Uh, and then he went on from there uh, to the World Bank, uh, performing, uh, fulfilling a variety of different positions there. I've always uh, thought about Bert. He was at that time, and he remains, as one of the most interesting uh, and deep thinking economists that I've ever encountered. Uh, he was certainly that uh, at the OECD as a young man and at the World Bank today. Uh, I think he remains one of the people that really is uh, breaking the mold, thinking ahead, and providing insights. So I'm delighted that he's found time in his schedule uh, to come here today uh, and to help us think about the future uh, of the Chinese economy. I really do know of no other person uh, that is better informed and better able to do that. So Bert, we're delighted you're here. You have the floor. Well, thank you, Ian, for inviting me and for the very generous, uh, very generous introduction. And I don't know whether I can live up to the introduction, uh, but I do recall your leadership in, in the OECD Center as the, and also as the research director in the World Bank. And now you're in this fantastic town, my first time in Oxford. So I, I, I especially spent some more time this morning to walk around to, to imbibe the atmosphere. And I'm delighted to speak here at the center. I really uh, think the Martin School uh, signifies something which is very modern. It's multidisciplinary. It is looking at issues from a whole variety of angles. And frankly, uh, the, the older I get, because I am getting older, the more narrow I think, actually, that the economics view on the world is. Uh, I won't give too much of an economic view, or at least not much of a technical view. I will go through. Uh, a, a range of slides that illustrate some of the economic con uh, concepts, but, but largely I, I, I want to tell the story about China's future economy. Uh, you will have noted, and especially because Xi Jinping just visited the UK, which was a very important event, that China is, is rising and China is becoming more important. Um, uh, but China would say China is re-emerging. Uh, this is a slide, it's a combined slide of, of, of two sets of data that are all wrong, but they're still the best that we get. This is actually the historical slides, starting from year one to 2050. And, and it follows, if you want, to, Ian, to some extent. These, the, this, these were data from Angus Madison, uh, Madison, who gives fantastic data, the best possible estimates of historical GDP that is around. Uh, and there's OECD data and projections till the mid-century. And so what you, what you see is, is uh, year one, actually India is the largest economy. If India wasn't uh, a unity as such, but India, if you added it all up, that was estimated to be the largest economy. China, the second largest economy, and then you have entities such as the Roman Empire and other, and other minor economies. Um, India remains the largest economy until the 15th, 16th century, and then China emerges as the largest economy in the world until around 1870. 
uh, when the United States takes over. Britain as such has never, of course with all its colonies, it was the largest economic space in the world, but as a, as a country, it never was the largest economy in the world. Um, and then you see that China basically disappears from the map. China goes from, well, 20% of the world economy to virtually nothing by the time of the early 80s. As a fact, in the early 80s, China is as big as the Netherlands and Belgium combined. Um, and why is that? Well, uh, for a whole range of reasons, but China would say it, is, it was the, uh, the century of, of um, um, humiliation. Uh, China missed out on the Industrial Revolution, and that was probably uh, for them to blame, uh, in part because they had closed themselves off basically since the 16th century uh, from the outside world, just much as Japan. They missed out on the Meiji uh, um, um, uh, restoration in, 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 in Japan, tried something at the end of the empire in terms of uh, reforms, but by and large did not manage to stage uh, an economic rev revolution such as Japan had and many other countries. Um, China also was invaded by Britain and by other, by other countries in the 19th century and then invaded in the 20th century by Japan. They fought a civil war. They, the communists took over in 1949. Uh, there was a great leap forward, which was an economic disaster, uh, a cultural revolution, which was majorly damaging to the economy, and then Deng Xiaoping emerges as the successor, well, the second successor to Mao Zedong. Hua uh, Guofang was the first successor. And Deng Xiaoping basically starts something which he would call uh, opening up and reforms. Um, with a fantastic speech, if, if you are, the, the, there's a, quite a few Chinese uh, students here, but it's uh, emancipate the mind, speaking, uh, seeking truth from facts and unite as one. A speech given in 1978, which basically lays out the principles of China's reforms. And they're tremendously successful. They're tremendously successful, and they trigger, by and large, 30 years of very rapid growth. On average, about 10%, 9.5%, 9 to 9.5% per capita basis, and China is re-emerging. Looking ahead, and that's what I want to do today, looking ahead, if you project more or less the trends going forward, China will be the largest economy again, well, probably already by the next decade, but definitely by, by the mid-century. The mid by the end of the century, India will be back uh, on top but by mid-century, China will be. How are these numbers made? Well, it, it's, it's nothing too fancy. It's basically looking at how far is China away from the production possibility frontier from the rich countries, and how, how prolific has it been in catching up in the past, and then given demographics and given savings rates, you can more or less project what, what an economy would do. It's, it's not the truth, but it's the best that we have in these very medium, in these long-term projections. So by mid-century, China will be again the largest economy in the world. Uh, uh, this is on a, on, a, on a PPP basis projected, so basically using 2010 prices going forward. I, I mentioned these prices because they're actually gonna play a, a, a bigger role. In dollar terms, it's my projection that China will catch up much, much faster, and I'll show you why during this presentation. So today, China is already very big. As a matter of fact, some would say, in comparable prices, in purchasing power parities, China is already the largest economy in the world. Uh, China definitely would like to say that now we're still the second largest economy in the world. But more importantly, we are a developing country. A strong emphasis of China on being a developing country. And if you look at this, this slide, uh, it, it gives you the share of the global population and the per capita income. And so the block, uh, the, 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 um, um, the area on, in that block gives you the size of the economy. Uh, this is in comparable prices. And so, so it's almost as large as this very, as the, the number one, uh, I should not step off the podium, I was instructed, the number one, the United States. But on a per capita basis, China, is barely one-fifth of the United States. So China says, look, we're still a developing country, and, and even though 
under Xi Jinping, the tide is more or less changing. For a long time, China said, okay, because we are a developing country, we have our own problems, we have developing country problems, we focus on that. The outside world is not something that we want to focus on. And that's changing. That's, and frankly, if I were a scholar and a student now, that is, that is the most interesting thing that is happening now. It is China emerging on the global stage. Uh, China is already uh, the largest in many things. It's the largest manufacturing in the, uh, manufacturer in the world by, by, by uh, 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 a, long, a long margin. It's the largest exporter, not by a long margin, but it is the largest exporter in the world now. The United States is, is now second and Germany is third. Um, it's also the largest energy user and combined with that is the largest greenhouse gas emitter. It's the, it has the largest things in, 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 in many others. It is also a large consumer of commodity and commodities and compared to its share in the global population, uh, their outsized consumption of, of metals uh, and, and, uh, and, other, and other commodities, not, by the way, not of the agriculture commodities that you see here, where China is actually still under consuming. Uh, it's an area that will most likely increase. So it, it, China, this rapid growth is fed by lots of investment, by lots of infrastructure, and lots of real estate, and for that you need iron and steel and cement. There's this one quote that I still try to check. Uh, that It says that China has used more cement over the last four years than the United States in the last century. I don't know whether it's true, but it sounds really quite impressive. Um, China is also the largest in, in, in many other things. It's the largest, uh, it has the largest banks in the world. It has the largest telecom companies. It has one of the largest online shopping markets. Alibaba is an absolute phenomenon in, uh, in China, and I'm sure very soon uh, in the rest of the world as well. Um, China's slowing down. China has had been growing with about 10% a year on average, almost like clockwork, for 30 years. And then the global crisis happened. The global financial crisis, which of course also affected China. That is a very open economy, uh, open to trade, open to foreign investment. And China was affected in a matter that I will discuss more in detail down the road. So growth slowed down. And, and uh, those of you who study China, they must have heard of, of, of Xi Jinping's very, very smart device. He mentioned, he named this, he gave the slowdown a name. So the slowdown from 10% to 7% as where we are now has become the new normal. And how brilliant is that? If we have a population that for 30 years has grown with, with 10%, you need to switch the minds of people because otherwise they make the wrong decisions based on the 10% projection. So this whole new normal, the 7%, is becoming the mantra of Xi Jinping. But even with 7%, and this is the, basically the contribution to the world economy, right? So this is the, the absolute number of, of growth that you have, the, the change in GDP from one year to the other for all countries. So China was growing at 10% in, in, in 2005, in 2006, in 2007, uh, and it's growing at 7% in 2014, 7.3%. But because China has been growing with 10% in the intermediate years, the 7% now is as big as the 10% in the past. So in terms of addition in size to the world economy, in a way, nothing has changed. The problem is that everybody had expected more. And, and that is a lot of adjustment that you see. You see it in international markets. You see it on commodity markets. So they're also adjusting to this new normal. And, and that causes, frankly, a lot of, a, a lot of volatility and, and hurts some of the commodity-dependent countries that have that are quite, had been quite reliant on China's demand. The situation will correct itself, but over time only, as, long, as soon as the inefficient, the inefficient production capacity and commodities are being phased out. China has a dream, and China's dream, it's Xi, Xi Jinping's, again, Xi Jinping's theme. I, I refer a lot to the leadership because in China the leadership is very important in, te in terms of what direction the economy takes. Uh, Xi Jinping has formulated his vision for China uh, and basically his, his, his long-term vision for China as the China dream. Uh, fortunately, he cut it up in, 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 in two parts, two goals, two centennial goals. 
So by 2021, uh, the uh, centennial of the founding of the Communist Party in China, uh, China wants to have achieved, which was, is really an old Deng Xiaoping goal, uh, the moderately prosperous society. By 2049, the century after uh, the founding of the New People's Republic, uh, China wants to be a modern socialist country, prosperous, strong, democratic, culture advanced and harmonious. Quite a goal. Um, the second part has less to do with economics, and I will say a little bit at the end of my speech, if I have the time, more on, on, on the social aspects, the, uh, uh, the inclusion aspects, the, the democratic aspects of, of, that, of that leadership's dream. But I'll focus by and large on that, that, that first goal, how to become moderately prosperous. And, 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 and we basically interpret, we at the World Bank, we interpret it as being, becoming a high income country. Uh, it's, China is already a higher middle income country. And to become a high income country, you need about 6.5% growth for the rest of this century uh, to make that. Not unachievable. As a matter of fact, uh, the guidance of the party to the government for the coming five year plan exactly points at the 6.5% growth rate for uh, the next five years. So, in that sense, the moderately prosperous society would be achieved. Um, but that's not a given. Frankly, the world economy is not in great shape, and China has gotten some, some headwinds from that. And China is going through a very difficult transition. And, and some call it the middle income trap. I don't like the word, but, but increasingly, these are actually some of my colleagues, um, Homi Karas and um, uh, I should, I, I should know that. Homi Karas, at least, he's a former colleague now at, at Brookings, uh, invented this concept of the middle income trap. And there is more increasing evidence that actually it's quite hard to move from high middle income to high income for, for a number of reasons. And, and, but the, the key reason is that sort of what the, the growth model that you used to go from low income to middle income is running out of steam. Uh, growing from low income to middle income, and China is in a way not different, maybe the scale is very different and the speed has been very different, but China is not very different from other countries in that uh, it got a lot of growth out of moving people, I mean, not people moved, I should say, from agriculture to manufacturing and services, so from low productivity to higher productivity occupations. China was effective, uh, as many other countries have, in mobilizing the savings and the capital to make the investments that make people more productive. And China was uh, uh, like other middle-income countries, like, like other, uh, many other East Asian countries, opened up from the very start, uh, uh, opening up and reforms was, was Deng Xiaoping's guidelines to the outside world, and therefore could very easily import a lot of foreign technology through FDI, through special economic zones, which made the whole population more productive. So that's great, but then at middle income or at high middle income, uh, it's, it's, it's what Lewis, Arthur Lewis in the 50s already said, you're running out of surplus labor. So this movement of people from the countryside to more modern occupations no longer gives you growth. And China, China is running out of, 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 of those people quite early on for a variety of reasons, in part because it's actually quite hard to move from the countryside to the city. Uh, China has a household registration system which basically ties all your social benefits and your education of your kids and your health care and your pension to the place where you were born. That's not a great recipe for, mobi for, for mobility. And so the wedge, the wedge between countryside and city is actually becoming quite large. And part people are sort of no longer want to move anymore because it's not worth it. It has to deal with other things as well, but it has to do with the household registration system. Uh, I'll come back to that because it's an important factor in demand as well. Now, if you look at the history of this transition from middle income country to high income country, uh, it, it doesn't happen an awful lot. 
it's, it's a sad story that most middle-income countries stay middle-income. This, this is the chart really that plots the relative income to, compared to the United States uh, in 1960 and then uh, in 2010. And only that, that little square, the blue dots up front, made it from then middle income to now higher income. Singapore, Greece, well, Greece is at risk maybe, but it's still a higher income country. Uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, the province of China, as we said, the World Bank. Uh, Mauritius, Equatorial Guinea, uh, and Hong Kong, China. Uh, a very, very select group. Many didn't make that transition. And why didn't they make that transition? Well, the, the, I, I think there's a couple of factors. But w one factor is, is and, and all of them are relevant for China. Uh, the one is this new growth model, uh, uh, new ways of growing. A country doesn't have the institutions to make that work. And how do you grow in a new way? Well, you grow in a new way by increasing productivity, by becoming smarter, by doing things differently, by innovating. It's a very big theme in the, in the forthcoming five-year plan in China. Uh, that requires a very different set of institutions in a country than growing rapidly, mobilizing lots of capital, getting people, to absorb, uh, getting people absorbed in cities, what many countries work with. The second, the second and, and I think a very relevant for Latin American countries, is that many countries run into macroeconomic problems right at that point. And it's the story basically of Latin the Latin American debt crisis, but it's also the Middle East that ran into problem at that point where they were growing rapidly, they were boring a lot because growth was going into, uh, into the sky, and suddenly growth collapses. And you see in Mexico running into trouble with its, with its international payments in 1981. They basically lose two decades of growth. Brazil, very similar. I mean, Brazil goes into a phase of hyperinflation simply because it hasn't managed its macroeconomy well. Now, you can say, well, that's because there were wrong policymakers and they, they didn't know their monetary equations. But I think there's actually something much more, much more fundamental at work. It is a point in time, and, and Ian has done studies on that in, 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 at the OECD Development Center, where, where you also need the political, the political uh, 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 institutions to make the trade-offs, to make the hard choices, to basically say, we're no longer going to grow with 10%, but we're going to grow with... 7%. Because you need to adjust, you need to adjust your borrowing behavior, you need to adjust your investment behavior, because if not, you'll find yourself on the wrong foot. That's the second, I think, important factor at this middle income level. So let's, let's look at China, on how China is doing, A, on shifting around its economy towards a new structure in the economy and, and becoming more innovative, and then B, look a little bit at the macro side. This is, by the way, excuse me, this illustrates to some extent the point that China, because it's growing so rapidly, it's actually only middle income uh, for, for not that long a period of time. I mean, it's about, it's about uh, 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 well, this was, this was a little earlier, but uh, 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 it, it's growing so rapidly that it's now facing, it, it faced less than two decades ago, it faced the transition from a low income to a middle income country, and now it's facing the income, the transition to a high income country. You see Taiwan and Korea did very well, but you do see the Mexicos and the Brazils and to some extent the Malaysians of the world that, that sort of stopped growing at around this, 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 higher, income, uh, this higher income threshold. Well, China uh, has a lot to catch up. The earlier slide I showed, you know, it, it, it's still uh, uh, only $10,000 on PPP per capita. The United States is 50,000. The OECD is around 40,000 they still have an awful lot to catch up. And in the productivity per worker, they could, if they want, if they keep things together, they could basically say, well, we continue to import and, and, and we continue to, to, to aspire to, to, to sort of a similar production structure as OECD countries. So the potential of catch up is definitely, is definitely there. And this is, this is the same uh, 
value added per employee that underlies these projections of the OECD up until 2050. These are the underlying productivity projections. So even if China does well, by the way, which needs to be observed, by mid-century, it's by far the biggest country in the world, but it's only about half the per capita income of the United States, even if it continues to grow rapidly. Um, people are a lot worried about China and, and, and that they have invested an awful lot, and if you want, there is, there is uh, Solo's curse that the more, uh, the more capital you have, your investment does, doesn't add as much to your, to, your, to your income as before. But if you try and add it all up, if you try and make an estimate of what China's capital stock actually is, and this is my very imperfect estimate, it's basically adding up all the investments done since 1960, and then putting a discount rate uh, for depreciation uh, to, to, the, to the capital stock, a depreciation of 5%. Very crude, very crude measure, and uh, undoubtedly wrong. But the surprising thing is that China actually, well, it still has far less capital per labor than, say, the United States, Japan, Germany, the rich countries. So even though they might get less growth, you could say that, well, there's an awful lot of potential still to invest, to build up the capital stock, despite already rapid growth, despite already the buildup of a lot of capital over the last 30 years. Now, I know these numbers are wrong, and frankly, the, 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 it's a nightmare to look at these, these investment numbers, because one of the big factors is also that uh, capital today is not the same as capital yesterday. So investment today is not the same as investment yesterday, and you're having a real deflator problem. It's, it's becoming far cheaper to invest now. So you could say, if, if you take that into account, China probably ends up quite a bit higher, because it started investing late. This is from the 1960s. It really started investing sort of in, in earnest, well, really after the, after the 1990s. So the more recent investment uh, uh, gets you more capital for your dollar, probably. But I don't, I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, the, the, the statistics to, to undermine it. Anybody who wants to write their thesis on it, this is a fantastic, fantastic topic. It's actually, it's, it's, it's a globally relevant topic right now. Uh, 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 Larry Summers' uh, 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 secular stagnation builds in part on this, on this problem. He basically says, look, we don't need that much investment anymore because Investment goods are now so much cheaper, so you don't. You, 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 but but everybody still saves the way the, the way they used to save. So you have excess savings because there is far less investment needed. Uh, he he adds interesting things, as he's saying. Well, Airbnb doesn't doesn't own anything, and yet they're a very big company. But it is a very it's, uh, 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 it's a shift in the thinking about about investment and capital. But by all measures, China still has a lot to invest and still can get some growth, maybe not as much as before when it had very little capital, but it's still far away from the high income countries in terms of capital per labor. Um, a, a second way to catch up is to become smarter or to have your workers become smarter. And this is the Barrow and Lee numbers, again, fantastic numbers done by, uh, on, that, that measure uh, basically, the number of years of schooling of everybody on average in the labor force. And so you see, you see uh, China has been catching up quite, quite, quite rapidly. Uh, Germany, interesting enough, <laughs> was quite late to go, going to a massive higher education. But Korea, very famous for major investments in, in primary education in the 60s and major investment in secondary and tertiary education in the, in the, uh, beyond the 70s. And so, so uh, if Korea is to be an example for China, they are now a very innovative, creative society with very high, uh, uh, highly skilled labor force. So you can actually, uh, uh, if you want, instrumentalize this innovative, this innovative society if we believe the example of Korea. China's well underway. This only goes to 2010. Uh, the, the expansion of tertiary education in the cohorts is absolutely astounding. Uh, I always say I'm so happy I'm no longer 20. I know a lot of you people here are 20 or, or, or are students because the number of students you have to compete with in China is quite uh, astonishing. The, the cohort attendance of tertiary education is now 25%. When I started working on China in 1992, it was 3%. 
and it was 0.1% in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping started its, refor its reforms. So there's a massive investment in human capital, which, which is coming on the labor market, frankly, and, and which is, unfortunately for you, is going to compete with a lot of you here, uh, a lot of you here in the room. Um, China has the savings to, to finance the investment also in the human capital. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very high saver, exceptionally high saver, almost 50%, probably an excessive saver to some extent, 50% uh, of GDP almost being saved. Uh, not just households, but also enterprise. Uh, enterprise saving is a very, uh, as everybody saves. It's very unusual in a society that, that all major sectors in the economy are actually savers. Uh, households save about 30% of their, of their disposable income, but enterprises savings adds up to about 20% of GDP. It's retained earnings. Uh, whether that's right or not, it, it may signify something about the governance of enterprises in, 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 in China that so much of profits is being retained, but it's a major financier of this high investment rate that has driven China's, China's growth. And the government saves. The government saves its current, cur current revenue minus current expenditures. China, China's government invests a lot, so they run a deficit, but technically, in a, in a definition sense, they have a high savings as well. Um, so, so if you want the basics, uh, 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 smarter people, still lots of investment to do, lots of savings to finance it, are still there. Now the question is, okay, well, is China, China's economy, is China's economic, economic structure changing in a way that you sort of expect once you move to this higher income level? Well, again, uh, it looks pretty convincing. China's services sector has been uh, 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 growing quite rapidly, has been the major contributor to growth and employment, and is now uh, about 10 percentage point of GDP larger than manufacturing. Uh, every stock market around the world and every investment bank around the world looks at the, 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 the PMI, the Purchases Managers Index, uh, for China's manufacturing. Well, that's okay but services is now more important. And services are growing very rapidly, retail sales are growing very rapidly, uh, financial services are growing very rapidly, uh, um, uh, real estate services are growing very rapidly, healthcare, education, you name it, everything is growing really quite rapidly. Unlike manufacturing industry, which is not doing well. So you see quite a very strong, a strong shift in the composition of the broad sectoral composition of, of China's economy. Um, if you do it in real numbers, so if you take 2005, 2005 prices, this big transformation is a little less. And that's, that's very, that for economists, this is very beau mot, uh, if you want. The, the, the productivity increases in the services sector is not as rapid as in manufacturing, and therefore the relative price of service is actually increasing compared to manufacturing. So in real terms, it's actually not as dramatic as the nominal numbers show. But nevertheless, that transformation is, is happening. Um, the service sector will be helped further by further urbanization. Uh, every country, uh, the rapid growers uh, in, in the past have shown that, look, the, the, the service sector is, is, is really taking off once, once urbanization is taking off. And China is, not, China is not different. It's rapid urbanization in the past has facilitated the emergence of a, of a service sector. Uh, I don't know. When, when you went for, if you went to China, when you were first to China, the services sector, I couldn't find it in 1992 when I was first there. Uh, by now it is thriving, it is everywhere. It is uh, a, a very, a very um, uh, strong, strongly developing part of the economy. And China is still less urbanized than expected on the basis of its income. Uh, this is the China's urbanization since 1980. In 1980, urbanization less than uh, 20%. And by now, well, here it says 50 years, but now it's 55. But it's still less than you would expect, roughly, on the basis of its per capita income. So, potentially, there's still a lot of urbanization to come. But I mentioned this household registration system. It is a big impediment to further, to further urbanization. And it's one of the big reforms that China could undertake to accelerate the transformation in its economy. Um, a second question is, is, is China becoming more, more innovative? Is its, is its production set becoming, uh, 
getting higher value added, becoming more sophisticated. Uh, the numbers uh, are from, uh, um, I have it here, uh, they're again fantastic numbers. Uh, it's on economic complexity, which is basically uh, a measure of how sophisticated the goods produced in an economy are. And uh, th there's, a, there's a whole literature behind it. Uh, I'm sure you're going to get the, 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 um, uh, the citation from, from the printout or from the website, uh, but it's worth looking at it. But basically, the summary of this is that th th these are people that have shown uh, the, uh, from, from Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, they've looked at the sophistication of the overall export set, which is only a subset of what is being manufactured in China, but it's a good indication of what is happening in the rest of the economy. And China has been always been on the very high end of sophistication, and it's getting more sophisticated. If you want the innovation part of the economy, the new, the new products, the new way of doing business, is actually doing relatively well, according to this measure. If you look at the composition of exports uh, in terms of goods, uh, you see that, that uh, the, the sophisticated goods, the computers, the broadcasting equipment, and, th and so the, the high tech, if you want. Uh, office machines sound boring, but there's a lot of high tech in there. Uh, uh, that part of the economy has, has lar greatly increased, and the, 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 the lower end uh, textiles is decreasing. So you see this transformation of the economy, there's more detail, the commodities, China used to be actually quite a strong commodity exporter. In the, in the 80s, it was a, a net oil export as well until the mid 90s. Uh, it, it, it exported many other commodities as well. That's basically gone. It's a major commodity importer now. So, so China's actually doing relatively well on this transformation of its economy. China's also becoming more innovative in a more formal sense. Uh, a, a lot of patents, all, all, these, all these people that now go to, to universities, they produce a lot of patents. And, and you see China's patents filed exploding. China's patents per capita is not as high as, as, as the US or, or, or the, the, well, it has surpassed the UK. There's one problem with this, uh, the, the uh, patents are not of great quality. And how do we know? Well, they're all filed in China and very few are filed abroad. So if you have a great pattern, you want to file it in all major markets. China still does very little of that. In part, it is maybe not marketing savvy, but in part, it's also that the quality of the pattern simply does not allow filing in the United States or in the, in, in the, in the EU. But again, that is increasing as well. It's now only 5 to 10%. Uh, it's growing over time. So an increased sophistication, more, uh, more innovation, more R&D, which we also see China is well ahead in spending on R&D, given its level of, of per capita income. So the, the the, 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 all the supply side indicators of, of, of transformation of China moving to a, a higher income economy, a more modern, if you want, a more modern economy, they all look pretty good. Um, I won't discuss this. this is, uh, it will take me too long to discuss, but it, 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 it has to, this has to do with catching up that will actually be more rapid, but I won't discuss this in this speech. So how about demand? Well, demand faces some headwinds, and I mentioned it before. China's new normal did mean that growth, and growth, if we talk about growth, is really the demand side of growth that you're talking about. The supply side gives you potential GDP, but actual GDP comes from the demand side. So this is what you see is, is realized, realized uh, demand. And China's new normal does mean that since 2011, when it was still growing at 10%, uh, a, a decline in demand to about 7% now. Um, a big part of demand for China used to be exports. Uh, exports used to make up 35% of GDP before in 2007. It's now 23 uh, what happened in between is the global financial crisis. So here you have China as being a very export-oriented economy, and suddenly you have this big chunk of demand dropping out. So what China did, um, and actually the, the, the prospects for trade are not good. If this is global exports uh, 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 as a share of... Uh, of uh, 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 so as, as, as the trend before the global financial crisis and after the financial, global financial crisis, 
and prospects for export don't look good, or they look by far worse than, than before the global financial crisis. There's a couple of, couple of reasons for that. Uh, one, probably before the global financial crisis, uh, trade intensity majorly increased because supply chains in the world changed, and China was very much part of that story. So it meant that per end product, a lot more import and export from one country to the other took place. So that, that explained the very high growth trend in exports. Second, uh, demand. A lot of demand in uh, countries around the world uh, after the global financial crisis comes from the government side. It's government deficits. It's spending to get out of the crisis, whether successful or not. Uh, government demand is very different from investment demand and from consumer demand. It's less trade intensive. Why? Because governments largely spend on non-tradables. They spend on infrastructure, on stuff to build, and, and, and uh, on health and education, which is all non-tradables. So, so a bigger chunk of demand comes from a, a government which spends less on tradables. That also explains less trade intensity. That's not great for the country such as China that has relied a lot on exports. Uh, so what China did was stage a major, a record, credit boom in order to finance investments to keep growth going. So if you want, uh, uh, everybody talked about a fiscal st or a stimulus uh, around, around the world, China did it. But China did it with considerable risk. The, 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 credit, the credit growth, and there is, there's a shadow banking, which is sort of aggregate financing, which includes shadow banking. I can, I can go into that in the Q&A. But it basically, a massive, a massive credit-financed stimulus was staged between 2009 and now. China is still easing out. China is still easing out of that credit binge. And if you look at the numbers on aggregate financing, uh, the growth rates are now down to 15, about 15%. <coughs> but it means that China is still building up debt. And debt has become a real issue in China. Uh, overall debt, I mean, this is, these are McKinsey numbers. They're, they're probably a bit too high. The World Bank says we're sort of around 240, but the, the, McKinsey produced better charts, so I, I, I decided to take this one. Um, lots, of, lots of debt, mostly manufacturing industry, uh, and a rapid increase in debt. There's government debt as well, but that is actually relatively limited compared to many other countries around the world, compared to with Japan with 190% uh, of, of, of government uh, debt to GDP compared to the US where it's around 90% of GDP. A lot of European countries around 70, 80% of GDP. China's government debt to GDP is, is, if you count it really all and all the contingent liabilities, the contingent debt, you probably come not more than 50% on the books is probably something like 40%. So still a relatively low indebtedness. But the buildup of debt, and especially the buildup of debt in, in manufacturing industry has been very, very rapid. And has become a risk. Because if you build a very, very rapid debt, you need to service the debt. And if then you rely on growth to sell your, to sell your goods, and then suddenly your new normal kicks in, then that debt becomes harder to service. Uh, debt levels to GDP are, are well ahead of, of, of what they are in, in, uh, in uh, what they were in, in other relatively rapidly growing countries. And you see, you see China's debt really skyrocketing, is the capital GDP and debt level skyrocketing uh, here after the global financial crisis, uh, much ahead of what, uh, what uh, Korea or Japan did, did in the past. Um, and the, 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 the story, the history, the experience around the world is if you have such a rapid buildup in debt, you're probably going to end up in trouble your non-performing loans in your banking system are likely going to go up. The, the big question is how much? Well, right now, China's officials' uh, uh, non-performing uh, loans are still very low. They're about, uh, they're about a percent. Uh, if you were to, these are all the countries in the world sort of given, given their credit to GDP 
compared to what you expect a creditor GDP ratio to be. Um, if you were to take this serious, and you see it's, it's, it's a very loose relationship, it's not a very tight relationship, but if you were to take the regression line serious, China would be more in the order of 8, 9, 10% of GDP in MPLs. Not yet there, uh, in part maybe because it's not recognized, in part maybe because it hasn't happened yet. But with a slowdown in the economy, with declining profitability in public and private enterprises, this is going to be a problem. Is it going to be a big problem? Not necessarily. I said China's government's debt to GDP is only 40 to 50 percent. So if 10 percentage point of credit were to go bad, China could manage. They would end up with 70 percent of GDP if they were to absorb it all on the government's books. Not necessarily the, the right strategy, but there is enough debt capacity to, to prevent a major accident from happening in the banking system because of all the debt buildup. So something of concern, it's not something that's going to kill growth in China. Um, with the slowdown, the real estate sector, I mean, part of, part of, part of the stimulus uh, was really a, a lot of buildup of real estate, and you see real estate investments growing more rapidly than overall investments after, after the, the, the stimulus kicks in. Here you see the global financial crisis, the stimulus kicks in and real estate takes off. Well, they build a bit too much. And the stock of real estate, the stock of housing that you now see given current demand means that they have about two years of excess capacity. And frankly, quite a bit of it is in the wrong place. Quite a bit of the real estate was built in secondary, tertiary cities that might never be used. But two to three years, is, is problematic, and that's why real estate investors uh, uh, are reducing their investment growth. They see, this, they see it coming, that they can't sell their real estate now, and that's dragging down growth for now. That's not going to be forever. The demand is still there. Uh, the actual houses are being sold, but it will take a while to, to unwind this, to unwind this um, um, excess, excess real estate, and it means that Investment is going to remain weak for quite a while, driven by real estate. It was led by real estate during the, during the stimulus. Now real estate is dragging down China's investment growth. So we don't have much exports, and investment's not looking so good because of the problems in, in debt, and maybe the big driver of investment real estate is not going to do so well. So the big hope is consumption. Well, unfortunately, consumption is not doing so well and has never been doing so well in China. As a matter of fact, the share of consumption in, in GDP, and this is public and, and private uh, consumption, is only 50%. Uh, the other 50% is basically, is basically investment, and there's a little bit of net exports in between. Uh, uh, why, why is that so? Well, uh, household income, Throughout, throughout the, uh, I mean, this is a long time since the reform period has been coming down. And, and the household income as a share of GDP. And given a more or less constant consumption ratio that households have, consumption ratios don't jump, you see this household consumption declining. Now, why, why is that? And, and, and at the same time, you see that wages, wage increases, have been doing very well. Well, it's basically that China has been growing so rapidly that wage increases have simply lagged, have simply lagged a very rapid GDP growth. The, the movement of people from agriculture to manufacturing is great, but manufacturing requires a lot more capital. And somebody needs to pay for that. So agriculture is largely labor. If you don't count land, and China doesn't really count land, they don't have a good reward system for land. So everybody gets better off. You move from the countryside to manufacturing, but somebody needs to pay for the investment. And that, if you therefore grow your, your manufacturing, the rewards for capital take an increasing share of the pie. And that's why household income is declining, but again, Everybody is benefiting. Now, the good 
story is that this bot it seems to have bottomed out, and there's many reasons for that. One of them is, is this growth in the services sector, the services sector that is much more labor intensive, uh, that is demanding a lot of, uh, a lot of labor, and the increased product labor productivity in the rest of the economy. It's pulling up household consumption a little bit. Unfortunately, probably not rapidly enough. So what to do? Well, there's one factor left, and that's government spending. And government spending is something that can keep the demand side of China's economy going at around 7%. Why can they? The deficits are still relatively low. The central government deficit is less than 2% of GDP. It's probably going to end up a little bit more this year. And the debt is still quite low. So managing that demand side, if done well, would actually keep China's growth relatively on track. So what do we think? And I'll, and I'll stop here because I, I, I talk too long. I have lots of other slides that I can take into the discussion, but uh, th th there's, there's more difficult issues than growth, I think. So what do we think China is going to do over the next five year plan? Well, largely, <laughs> it's, the, it's the new normal. Uh, China is going to grow with around on average, we, on average, we say 6.4 percent. So uh, uh, the government says six, a minimum of six and a half. So they'll probably aim for something a bit higher, but 6.4 seems to be a fairly reasonable growth rate for the next five years. More driven by consumption, by household consumption as well as government consumption. Less driven by capital formation. You see the highlight of private consumption. And so there is a number of assumptions underlying this projection. The key assumption, the broad assumption is, is that the reforms in China will continue at a relatively high pace. One of the key reforms that will drive private consumption as a demand factor will be the household registration reforms. And, and imagine, I mean, right now, Yes, urbanization is 55% of, uh, of, of, of the population, but 250 million migrants in China's cities right now, they don't have household registration. So they have, I mean, some of them do really well. Some of them work, work in the financial sector. Some of them are leftover students that stayed in the cities and they do exceptionally well. But a lot of them are you know, workers in construction, they're workers in, 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 in industry that are only temporarily there. They can't bring their kids, they can't bring their family, a few do because you can't get a good education. So what if you reform that and you say, no, actually, anybody who comes can get a, a resident permit and the resident permit gives you the right on a place for your kid in school, a place for uh, your, your, your health services in the city and maybe subsidized housing, which urban residents already have that would be a major boost for consumption. Second, if you were to give up that household registration system, people can move wherever they would like to move. And where would they like to move? Well, maybe places that are nice, such as Oxford, but actually what people usually do, they move where they have a job. So they move where they're most productive. So also from the supply side, for bringing in that new, innovative, more productive China, the reform of the household registration system is absolutely key. It will cost some money, and that's been the big bottleneck because local governments say, well, we can't accept all these migrants. It sounds very much like a European story, but we can't accept all these migrants because they cost money. Whereas actually, there are factors of production that are waiting to be unleashed and to bring China's growth rate to a medium to high level, which will bring the Shao Kang society, the, 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 the moderately prosperous society, by 2021. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I'll just very briefly flesh through what I think are the more difficult issues. And, I, and I'm happy to take it up in the discussion because I want to go to q and A. I've talked too long. So the growth, keeping growth going, in my view, China's going to do relatively well. What is, what is, what is more important, what is more difficult, and I, is in my view, is to maintain the social cohesion in China. And I, I just give one slide of, of rising income inequality in China, uh, which has been very rapid. I mean, to some extent explainable, to some extent even desirable, 
but by now at a level which sits very uncomfortable with the leadership and brings a lot of tensions in society. And it is urban-rural disparities, but it's also intra-urban. It's, it's, it's hukou residents versus migrants, uh, and it's even within rural areas, disparities are now rapidly increasing. Managing that requires a lot of skills. It requires a lot of openness, and it requires opening opportunities for people so that everybody can benefit. I find that one of the more difficult challenges for China. Similarly, taking care of old age risks. Similarly, big challenge, taking care of China's health care. Uh, a second challenge, but I think that's already one, it's a lot talked about, is, is making China's growth more sustainable. Environmental damage is really quite high, even though in levels, percent of GDP is coming down. This is, these are World Bank estimates. Again, they're, they're, they're not the greatest estimate. But the, the environmental damage in China is, is large. When you hear my voice, this is the Beijing voice, because you get very, you cough a lot in Beijing because of the air pollution. Ian can't run in Beijing, he told me. But it's getting better. And frankly, the, uh, even though it is a big global issue and the CO2 issue is still very big, I think China has already decided to take the lead on it. And China is going to be part of the solution also of that big global issue. Um, the biggest driver of change is going to be China's energy economy. Already, energy intensity is declining. China is, is changing its energy mix in a major way. It's already the largest producer of alternative energy in the world, and it will continue along that track. Uh, it will still be hard work, and still very difficult international agreements, such as the COP21, but I believe that those problems can be solved. The final slides I had was for governing China. And I'll stop here and see whether there's any questions on that. Uh, with a rising middle class, and China will have a very rap rapidly rising middle class, uh, managing all these expectations, managing more contradictory demands on government, uh, increasing demands on government for healthcare, for pension, for clean air, for everything, is a very tough job. And the question is whether China's governance is ready for that. It's reasonably OK in effectiveness of government. It scores very lowly on voice and accountability. Now, China would say, this is actually wrong. These measures, the global, the worldwide governance indicators, it used to be produced by the World Bank, now it's <coughs> independent. They simply do not measure what is China. And there's an enormous amount of accountability and an enormous amount of democracy. And remember Xi Jinping's goal, a prosperous, democratic society by 2049. Thank you very much.